Well, welcome back everyone to the Mathematical Summer in Paris. Uh, the next lecture today is by Yuri Lima from uh, the University Federal of uh, Ceará in Brazil. So it's early morning for him, whereas it's early afternoon for us here in Paris. Uh, so, and he will talk about billiards and symbolic dynamics, please, Yuri. Okay, uh, thank you very much for the invitation and for the introduction in this very nice event that I already had the opportunity to, to talk two years ago. So it's a great pleasure to be back here. And this time I'm going to talk about something a little bit more, let's say, structured. Last time I gave a very broad uh, talk, which was about uh, the origins of symbolic dynamics and it had a, a lot of history and facts, uh, philosophical facts. And this time I'm going to dig into mathematics a little bit uh, more than I did uh, last time. So the topics I want to discuss are two. The first one is billiards and you might uh, know what billiards are because if you go to some restaurant or to some bar, you have seen that uh, rectangular pool in which you have uh, some spheres that you hit and you aim to 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 put these spheres these, these balls into the holes of the billiard table and there is a very simple mathematical model which is motiv not motivated by this but mimics this and this is what we are going to call billiards or dynamical billiards because we are actually interested in analyzing them from a dynamical point of view and well, in order to, to analyze them, I'm, I am going to introduce this tool or method, which is called symbolic dynamics. So this is the second topic of my talk. Okay, so let's start from the beginning. The beginning is part one, billiards. Let me warn you that uh, throughout my talk, I will show you four videos. And every time I do that, I will, I will have to switch here from my presentation to the video. So it will take about five to 10 seconds until the video, video loads. But well, we have uh, 90 minutes, so we are, we are okay. Okay, so coming to part one billiards, what's the, the history, at least from the dynamical point of view of uh, billiards? The history starts more or less in the end of the 18th century and beginning of the sorry the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century more or less about uh, 18, 1895 to 1915 something like that with the works of Boltzmann. Boltzmann he was interested in statistical mechanics and how did he want to analyze statistical mechanics? So let us assume that what he wanted was to analyze how the atoms move or the uh, gas atoms move inside a box. So imagine that you have a closed box and inside this box you have a gas. The, the gas is made of plenty of molecules and each molecule moves with unit speed in one direction. But well, they are confined in a space. So from time to time, these molecules, they hit the walls or they hit each other. And let us, let us assume that every time this happens, this happens according to the laws of optic, optics, for instance, in which the angle of reflection is the equal to the angle of incidence. So in this context, you have a conservation, law of conservation of energy, and the goal in statistical mechanics, at least for Boltzmann at that time, was to understand what was the behavior of the trajectories of each of these molecules. So you can imagine that you have plenty molecules inside this box. And well, each trajectory itself will make very complicated uh, very complicated movement. So what he actually wanted to, to analyze was the global behavior of all of these molecules which are subject to this specular reflections with each other and with the walls of the box. So to simplify 
uh, the understanding of this model. Let me show you the first video. So you see here, I, I've tried to put uh, a little bit more of a complicated model in which you have these, uh, these walls on the top and on the bottom. And as you see on the left and on the right, it's just like playing Tetris, uh, Pac-Man actually, in which when you go to the right, you come to the left. So it's, uh, there is an identification between the vertical walls. And you could also imagine that you have all the walls in this, uh, in this model. For instance, you have this fixed circle here, which serves also as a wall. And this arc in the bottom part of the square here, which also serves as a wall, and it uh, traps this red ball, which is moving very fast here in the bottom of the picture. So each of these balls, they have uh, some radii, they have some mass, and they are hitting each other, as I told you, according to the laws of physics, angle of incidence equals to the angle of reflection, conservation of energy, and so on. So you can, you can see here, for instance, that these red balls inside the big circle. Sorry, when I started it again, it muted you. Great. In the beginning, they are uh, still, they don't have uh, velocity. But as soon as they get hit by this very big uh, uh, pink or red ball, they start to move. So actually, this is a, a model that was not studied by Boltzmann because as you see, uh, balls have different radii and different masses. So you could actually imagine that inside the box, you have plenty of molecules, each of them with the same radius and with the same mass. So they are like the same, the same particle in different positions with uh, unit speed hitting each other and hitting the walls of the box. Okay, helper, let's go back to the slides. Great. So this was a, a video just to introduce to you what was the model that Boltzmann was interested. He made uh, very nice advancements in this, in this model, but I'm not actually interested in the physical perspective, at least not now. What I want to introduce to you is what we call dynamical billiards. So what are the dynamical billiards? The dynamical billiards are the same model here, in which we allow ourselves to change the shape of the table. So let us assume that you choose your preferred uh, shape and you play billiards inside this shape. So for instance, for some people, the preferred shape are smooth convex ones. So you could imagine the billiard table inside a circle or inside an ellipse or inside any other smooth convex uh, table. So this is the first class of uh, dynamical billiards that uh, we are going to consider. The second class is in some sense, it seems easier, but it's actually a little bit more complicated than the first one, is when we play billiards in polygons. Actually, this is exactly as we are used to see when we go to a bar, right? Because the usual pool table is in a rectangle. But you could also play in a triangle, in a pentagon, in a hexagon. I mean, it doesn't matter the number of sides of the polygon. And finally, I'm also going to discuss, and this is actually more important to my talk because it's is where uh, I and my co-authors, we have uh, concrete results on, are the dispersing and the Bunimovich billiards. So before I introduce them to you, I actually prefer to do that by showing other videos. So let us try to understand what happens, for instance, with a billiard in a circle. Helper, second video. Great. So here I've drawn the circle and I actually in this red thing that you see is a bunch of, bunch of particles, each of them making independent moves with respect to each other. So they are moving as if they were the only particle existing in this billiard table. And why do we show the video like this? Because we want to, to see what is the influence of the initial position and 
the initial direction that the particle has. And as you see, no matter the number of hits that these particles make with the circle, this, uh, these particles, they actually don't move too far away from each other. So they become, they, they continue being something connected, which grows a little bit, but not much. I mean, you see that these, these things are not growing too much. They are, they actually, these curves, these red curves, after each hit, they actually have a bounded size and it's actually uniformly bounded no matter the number of hits that the particles make to the boundary. Uh, you can show it one more time so that we have uh, of intuition. So you see the, the particles, they become very, they start very close apart with almost the same position, almost the same direction. And after some hits, well, they become a little bit further away from each other, but not much. And what is actually the reason that this is happening? This is happening because the billiard table in the circle has what we call caustics. Caustic, so a, a caustic for a point, is a curve in which the trajectory of this point is always tangent to this curve, which we call caustic. So by simple uh, Euclidean geometry, you can actually see that if you fix a position, position and direction in this circle, and if you draw a concentric circle passing tangent to this uh, initial direction and passing through this position, then the whole, okay, so now we can go back to the slides. Then the whole trajectory that is defined by this position and direction is going to be tangent to this concentric circle. So this concentric circle is what we call caustic. The origin of this word comes from the Greek. It comes with uh, uh, the, the meaning is something related to accumulation of heat. And you could imagine this because if you see the trajectory as being a beam of light, then this beam of light is going to be tangent all the time to this curve. So it's going to accumulate heat along this curve. And circles, they have a very simple family of caustics, which is exactly all the concentric circles with respect to the original table. So this behavior, it actually, tells us that if you want to analyze the trajectories of the points and directions in this circle billiard, it's very simple because they get confined to some particular regions, always being tangent to a particular concentric circle. And actually, this is not a particular feature of the circle. It's actually a feature of all the smooth convex billiards. So if you change the shape of the circle to the shape of an ellipse, the same thing is going to happen. You're going to have a set, uh, a continuum of ellipses, which are in some sense concentric to the original one, which diminish in size, and such that a trajectory that is tangent to each of, to some of these uh, ellipses at some point is actually going to be tangent at every time between collisions. So if you see one collision and the next collision in the segment, you are going to be tangent to this concentric ellipse. Okay. So this, uh, this is interesting because it's related to, to, a, uh, to a, a, a meaning in dynamics, which is called totally integrable systems. Totally integrable systems is a class of dynamical systems which has some sort of bounded behavior. Because as I told you, trajectories are confined to some regions of the space. So the behavior of each trajectory is bounded in the sense that trajectories do not go all over the billiard table. This has been studied uh, extensively and it's actually related to a field of mathematics in dynamical systems, which is very well developed, but still has many developments to go. And the name of this area is KAM theory, due to Komogorov, Arnold, and Moser. 
So the nice thing about billiards, and you can see it now from this first uh, example, is that if we change the shape of the billiard, we can go to different parts of dynamics. In, the, in this first example, if you restrict yourself to smooth convex billiards, we are in one part of dynamics, which is called of integrable dynamics. And it's, rela it's related to KAM theory. The second part of, uh, of dynamics that I want to discuss is motivated by the introduction of the second class of billiards, which are the polygons. And for simplification, I'm going to show the usual polygon that we have, which is the rectangle. It's actually the usual billiard table that we are used to see in a bar. So imagine here that you have, as usual, a single particle, and you hit this particle in some direction. So as I told you, the reflections are always preserving the angle of incidence with respect to the angle of reflection. So the trajectory will move until it hits the wall, it gets reflected, it moves again, it gets reflected again, it moves again, it gets reflected again. So the angle of the trajectory, it changes at every hit. But as you can see here, after one, two, three, and four hits, the trajectory is parallel to where it started. So we actually have a sort of period four behavior here with respect to the direction. And how can we explore this, this kind of uh, period four behavior in the directions here? Well, the idea comes again from optics in which when you want to analyze the behavior of this trajectory, and you could imagine this as being a beam of light, the trajectory of light, instead of reflecting the trajectory of the light, you could actually reflect the whole wall. In which sense? So here I just numbered uh, the hits, hit number one, hit number two, hit number three, four, and five, because then it will get easier for us to understand how do we make these reflections of the table. And it's as follows. So here in the bottom part of this picture, close to this the rectangle, which is close to the number one, we have the original trajectory, and it moves until it hits the top boundary of the table. And when it moves and it hits the top of boundary of the table, this trajectory should get reflected to remain inside the table. But as I told you, we are going to preserve the trajectory of the point. And actually what we are going to reflect is the table itself. So you see these letters here, C, B, J, M, E. As soon as we re reflect with respect to the top boundary of the rectangle, we get this new orientation for these letters. So you could imagine here that uh, the second rectangle, top left, is, re is the reflection of the top uh, of the left bottom one with respect to this horizontal upper boundary. And the good thing is that we, cha we, we, we change the orientation of the rectangle, but the trajectory of the point particle, it continues as if nothing happened. So it just moves in a straight line until it hits the boundary of the rectangle again. And when it hits the boundary of the rectangle, what do we do? We want to continue moving in straight. So instead of changing the direction of the particle, we reflect the table again. So now we reflect the table with respect to this number two. So it's with respect to the right boundary of this rectangle. So now the orientation, as you see here, changes. So this letter, this sequence of letters C, B, J, M, E gets twisted in this third rectangle. And we continue moving in a straight line until we hit it again. So we reflect again, reflect again, and reflect again. So as you see, after four reflections, so the one, two, three, four, fifth. So let me just, uh, okay. So the fifth, uh, one, two, three, the fifth rectangle has exactly the same orientation as the first one. 
but means that we actually came back to the original rectangle that we were. And why is this good? Because, well, this, this method is called uh, unfolding of the polygon. And since the, the rectangle has angles equal to 90 degrees, after a few reflections, we always come back to the same rectangle. So this gives rise to what we call a translation surface. A translation surface is just a reorganization of all, all of those reflections in a bigger rectangle like this one. So here you have the four possible reflections of the original rectangle. And if you do these possible reflections, well, the left bottom is uh, the reflection of the right bottom. So the left hand side is identified with the right hand side. And also the upper side is identified with the bottom side. So instead of doing a trajectory in a single rectangle which has fixed walls and you change the direction of the trajectory, what we could do is to consider the trajectory in this extended rectangle which has oriented, uh, oriented sides and identified left with right, up with down. And the good thing is that now trajectories are just straight lines. So you move here from this, uh, from this point and you go until you hit one, keep going straight until you hit two, keep going straight until you hit three. Well, three here is like Pac-Man, so left uh, up boundary is identified with bottom boundary. So we go back here to three, keep moving until we hit the right hand side of the rectangle, number four. So again, we play Pac-Man, so we enter through the left hand side of the screen, number four here, and continue moving. So this gives rise to this simplification, simplifi simplified model. And from the mathematical point of view, we have just introduced a translation surface, which is actually just the torus, because left hand side is identified with right, right hand side and top with bottom. So actually there is a huge community that is studying uh, translation surfaces in great generality, and they are related to playing billiards on polygons. And this gives rise to the second uh, class of dynamical systems, because contrary to the first one in which we have kind of uh, bounded behavior, everything was confined to some regions which are always tangent to caustics. Here, we can actually have a divergence of trajectories. There might be trajectories which are dense in the whole phase space of the billiard table. But nevertheless, the behavior of these trajectories, they are different from each other only at a polynomial rate. What do I mean? I mean that if you start with two trajectories which are very close to each other, after time n, their behavior can be at most can be different from each other at most n to a power. So this gives rise to what we call a parabolic dynamics because divergence of trajectories happens in a polynomial way. So again, comparing to the first one, the first one, divergence of trajectories is only bounded. Now it is unbounded, but it only explodes, it only increases at a polynomial rate. Okay, so this is the second class of billiards, which introduces to us the second class of dynamical systems, which are called parabolic ones. And now we go to the third class, which is actually more important to us because as I told you, is the class of, dyna of uh, dynamical billiards in which I work on and I have results on. And the difference is the following. Let me start uh, with the dispersing ones. So sorry, I had to keep some, some words here in Portuguese because these are pictures and it was very complicated for me to change these names in all the pictures that I have. So I kept the Portuguese ones. So what are the dispersing billiards? I'm going actually to focus on this first one, which is a kind of a rectangle, but uh, with uh, convex or concave uh, uh, sizes, sides. Actually, 
uh, what are they? So if you are inside the table and you look at the boundary, the boundary looks to to someone observing the itself, uh, the boundary from the inside of the table, it looks like a concave obstacle. But whenever you see the situation, you call the billiard dispersing. This is the case here in this left uh, hand billiard table and also in this right hand billiard table. So you could imagine for those who have done a few classes in mathematics, that this square here is the torus and inside the torus you have put two obstacles so this means the black parts so you have a full circle in the middle and you have also a circle here in one of the vertices of the square so because the the torus has this identification so this representation gets split into four quarters of a circle and whenever you put a point particle in, in the remaining of the domain when it looks at the boundaries of this obstacle, it sees the boundaries as being concave, exactly as in this first example here. So whenever this happens, we are going to call this billiards dispersing. And well, the name uh, is on purpose because dispersing billiards, as we are going to see in a video in a few minutes, it means that trajectories, they disperse and they actually disperse very fast in a way that even though two, tra two trajectories are very close to each other, after a few hits, they become almost in indistinguishable from each other. And this is the first indication that you have some sort of chaos going on in this billiard. Because this, what I, what I told to you, is just uh, the occurrence of what we call sensitivity to initial conditions. No matter how close two initial conditions are given, after a few iterations of the dynamics, the behavior of the trajectories is very different from each other. The two trajectories are almost in, indistinguishable from each other. So we call this as the initial conditions being very sensitive, the dynamics being very sensitive to initial conditions, okay? So this is the class of dispersing billiards. When you look from the inside, you see concave walls. The, set, the, the fourth class of billiards that I, that I want to introduce was introduced by a Russian mathematician called uh, Leonid Bunimovich in the 70s. So the billiards get his name, Bunimovich billiards. And here are three examples of these billiards. And as you see, if you are in the inside of each of the table and you look at the boundary of the table, you actually don't see anything concave. You see things that are convex and some things that are actually neutral, segments of line. This is, uh, you have here three examples and in the middle one, you have what, what I think is the most famous one, it's called the Bunimovic Stadium. The name is also a purpose because it reminds us of a football stadium. It's composed with two half circles, one half, half circle in the left, one half circle in the right, and they are joined together by two parallel segments. So you have a parallel segment here, a parallel segment here. And well, as you can see, and let me say it again, the observable from the inside when it looks at the boundary of this billiard table it only sees flat regions which are the two parallel segments and convex regions which are the two half circles this is totally different from the dispersing billiards but nevertheless it also exhibits some sort of sensitivity to initial conditions so we could also call these billiards as being chaotic this was discovered by Bunimovich in the 70s it, and it's actually, it was actually a great surprise to the physicists because the physicists did not believe that such an object could exist. Well, our intuition and at, at so far all the examples that we have showed induces us to think that if you have things that are convex, they are well, behavior, well behaved. If they are concave, they are chaotic. 
So it was very unexpected to find something that was the uh, it was the concatenation of convex and flat and still being chaotic. And to show to you to to give a, a sort of indication of this behavior, I'm going to show to you two videos. The first one is going to be an example of a dispersing billiard, and the second one is going to be the Bunimovic Stadium. So this this one that I just depicted to you. And just like in the second video, you're going to see a bunch of initial particles, each of them performing independent behavior with respect to each other. And all the particles are very close to each other in the beginning, but as you're going to see, after a few hits to the boundary, they will be totally indistinguishable from each other. Let's see. So the first example is of the Sinai, uh, the dispersing billiard, which is also called Sinai billiard. So you saw in the beginning all trajectories were close to each other, but you see here in the in this left hand side that they start to be all over the table, and not only their position is all over the table, but also their directions, the direction they are pointing to, is all over the circle. So this is this third picture here which gives a histogram of the possible directions of the particles uh, that we consider in the beginning. Okay, could you, could you run it again, Pierre Guy, please? Here we saw a bunch of particles again in the beginning all together, and then they started to move. So after a few hits, they become very indistinguishable from each other all over the table with all over the possible directions that you can have. So all possible angles from zero to two pi. So this is the first indication that these sorts of billiards, they have some sort of sensitivity to initial conditions, AKA chaos, okay? So now we will go to the fourth example, which is of Bunimovic billiards. And they also exhibit this sort of uh, chaotic behavior. Okay, so again, we started with, with a bunch of particles close together in position and in direction, and they start to hit the walls of the stadium. And you see after 10 or 15 iterations, they are already all over the table. And if you continue iterating, they start to spread more and more over the table so that they become almost indistinguishable from each other. Well, we have some trajectories that hit these flat regions almost perpendicular and they keep hitting many times. So for them, it takes a long time for them to get distinguishable because they ha you have to wait for them to leave this flat region. So as soon as they leave the flat region, then you see this chaoticity going on. So this video shows to us that dispersing billiards and Bunimovic billiards are in some sense different from the first two classes of billiards that we have considered. Okay, so now we can go back to the slides. And we are done from videos. This class of, uh, of, of billiards, this person and Bunimovic, they are actually a representation of a third class of dynamical systems, which are called the chaotic dynamical systems. The dynamical systems that exhibit some sort of sensitivity to initial conditions are what we call chaotic. Well, I should be, be careful about saying uh, chaotic because chaos is a word that actually depends on the definition. So people uh, in different uh, areas of mathematics, they call chaos different things. And for us here, chaos is going to mean sensitivity to initial conditions. If you start with two particles that are very close in position and direction, no matter how close they are, after a few iterations of the dynamics, 
their trajectories become very different from each other. And this, in all of the examples that we consider, is going to be reflected in some sort of hyperbolicity. So the word hyperbolic came into play for the first time. And actually, this third class of dynamics that I want to call is the class of hyperbolic dynamics. So now I have introduced to you the three main, let's say, areas in dynamical systems. The first one, the one motivated by circles and ellipses as billiards, and that I told you that you have a bounded behavior, is called elliptic dynamics, circle ellipses, elliptic dynamics. The second one of the polygons in which you have unbounded behavior but only polynomially big is called parabolic dynamics. And now the third one in which you have chaos is called hyperbolic dynamics. So a huge part of the study in dynamical systems nowadays is in some sense divided into, into these three classes. And what is nice about billiards is that we can get to the three classes, just changing the shape of the billiard. Okay, so this uh, almost concludes the first part of my talk, because now I'm going to aim at something. So what is the goal of my, of my talk now? The goal of my talk is actually to focus on this third class of the billiards, the ones which are chaotic, so this person and Budimovich ones, and to try to understand them from some perspective. And the perspective that I'm going to try to understand is using a method which is called symbolic dynamics. So before using it or showing to you what is the class of results that we have, I should do some introduction to symbolic dynamics. So this is part two of my talk. What is symbolic dynamics? Well, the easiest way which I consider because it's uh, very geometric, to see what symbolic dynamics is, is introdu introducing this simple dynamics, which is called the cat map. So what is the cat map? Here you have a two by two matrix, two, one, one, one. So we can all observe that this matrix has integer entries and that it has determinant equal to one. So, so far, so good. Well, because of these two properties that I just mentioned, this matrix, which is a two by two matrix, so it, uh, it induces us a linear transformation on the plane. It actually, because of these two properties that I mentioned, all the entries are integer and the determinant is equal to one. It induces also a transformation on the two torus. So just to remind you, the two torus is uh, equal to the plane divided by an equivalence relation in which you identify two points of the plane every time the difference of the x position is integer as well as the difference of the y position. Okay, so now instead of having a transformation in the plane, which was actually a linear transformation, we have a transformation in the two torus, which in some sense should resemble the linear transformation in the plane. Actually, if you want to see how this transformation is moving points in the two torus, let us draw here a fundamental domain of the two torus, which we all know it's a square, and we draw a cat inside itself. Well, the cat is, uh, for historical reasons, I think that when Arnold, the great uh, Russian mathematician Arnold, was studying uh, the cat map, the, this map, he drew the cat and he wanted to see how the cat got uh, distorted or what was the image of the cat under this map. Well, if we considered only the linear transformation in the plane, this square would be would have an image equal to a parallelogram. This parallelogram here that I drew in this right-hand picture. It passes through the origin, zero, zero. It passes through the point, one, one. 
it passes through the point 3, 2, and also through the point 2, 1. So in this way, the cat, which was nice, it got distorted more or less in the direction of this parallelogram. And this is the behavior of the cat under the linear transformation. So it's the behavior in the plane. But we actually want to see the behavior of the cat in the torus. So because of that, every part of, this, of the parallelogram that got outside the original unit square that we started with should be reassembled back to the unit square. So we get all the three pieces that are outside and we move them inside the unit square. How? Respecting the equivalence relations. So we only are allowed to move them back to the unit square by means of integer translations, vertically and horizontally. So for instance, uh, this square which is in the middle and below, it has to be translated back to the unit square by a unit moving horizontally. So you move one unit horizontally back to the unit square and it gets reassembled to the unit square. So if you do this with all the pieces that are outside of the unit square, you find out that the image of the cat in the torus is this weird uh, picture here, which is represented in the bottom right square here. Uh, just a, a question. Can you see my, my, my pointer? Yes, 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 yes. Now it's okay. in the bottom right corner. Yes, exactly. So as I was telling you, the image is this parallelogram. So this piece here to go back to the torus, it, get, it has to get reassembled. So we move it one unit to the left, pa. So it comes here. This one has to go one unit down and one unit to the left. So then it gets here. And finally, this part here has to be moved two units to the left and one unit down. So it gets reassembled here. So as you see, the image of the cat gets distorted and reassembled in a very complicated way inside the two torus. Although it's very simple to see it in the plane, when you go back, when you go down to the two torus, it gets more complicated. And now try to imagine what would be a second iteration of the cat. So if you want to do this one more time, well, you have to get this picture here. You have to apply this linear transformation in the plane again. So you're going to stretch the square again to a parallelogram. And you are going to see the three parts that fall outside of the unit square and reassemble them back to the original unit square. And then the image of the cat is going to be a mess. I, 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 have, I don't have uh, uh, artistic tools to, to being able to draw what would be the second image of this cat, okay? It's very complicated. And well, it's very complicated for one reason. And now I'm going to introduce to you uh, the beginnings of symbolic dynamics. The reason is that when we consider the unit square, we are considering a fundamental domain, which is very simple to us because we are used to the X and Y axis, things that are horizontal and vertical. But this matrix, it has a much better a uh, system of coordinates, which is given by eigendirections. So imagine uh, you can calculate directly here that this, this matrix, it has two eigendirections, one which is more or less like this, one which is more or less like this. This one, which is more horizontal, it is associated to an eigenvalue between z uh, one and two. I think one and two, yes. It's bigger than one, that's what matters. So it means that if you are in this eigendirection, the image of a vector in this eigendirection, it remains in this direction, but it gets further away from the origin. 
So things get expanded in this direction. And then on the other one, which is actually perpendicular to the original one, you have an eigenvalue between zero and one. And this means that a vector in this eigendirection has an image which remains in the direction, but the size of the vector gets smaller. We call this a contracting direction. So you have two eigendirections, one which is expanding, another that is contracting. And this is actually one of the reasons that the image of the square, it gets distorted and stretched in this parallelogram that I just drew. Okay, but there is another benefit on the existence of these eigendirections. And the benefit is, is the following. Well, these are directions that are meaningful from a dynamical point of view. So why don't we try to come up with a representation of the torus which has sides parallel to these eigendirections? This would be much easier for us because we know that eigendirections are preserved. So if we could come up with a domain like this, the image of the domain would be much simpler to analyze. And we wouldn't face a problem that we are facing right now. But you see, the original domain that we consider was the square, which has horizontal and vertical sides. And once we iterated, the sides no longer are horizontal, neither vertical. They are kind of diagonal. And as, is, as soon as we are able to find a new fundamental domain with sides parallel to these angle directions, this problem is going to vanish. How do we do this? Well, here is one of the possibilities that we can do in this example. So here is the usual tessellation of the plane into squares with sides parallel to the x and y axis. That's what we are used to, to do when we want to represent the two torus, but we could do it differently with what I call a dynamical tessellation. Each of these L-shaped figures is made, has, has as boundaries, segments which are parallel to the eigendirections. So this one here is parallel to the expanding eigendirection, this one to the contracting, this one to the expanding, contracting, expanding and contracting. And if we get this piece, this kind of uh, puzzle, and we move integer uh, number of times horizontally and vertically, then we can fully tessellate the plane using this puzzle. So this means to us that each of this puzzle is a different representation of our tutorials. And in order to analyze the dynamics of the cat map in the tutorials, we could use them. So here is the, what I call the dynamical lattice. And just to convince you that this is actually a fundamental domain, you see, comparing to the unit square, this puzzle, it has pieces that go beyond the unit square and it has some missing pieces. But if you, for instance, get this piece that is beyond and reassemble it back to the unit square, and we are allowed to do that by using integer translations. So here we can move this piece one unit to the right. It fills this piece here in the unit square. And we can do uh, this game uh, two more times, one with this piece here, which is also beyond the unit square. We move it one unit horizontally to the left and we, and we reassemble it to this piece. And we do this, the same thing with this triangle here in the upper region. And we move it one unit down, so it becomes this triangle here. And the conclusion is that the three pieces that are beyond the unit square, they reassemble back to the unit square in a way that we reobtain the unit square. So this is just a justification that indeed this puzzle here is a different way of representing our tutorials. So it is what we call a fundamental domain of the tutorials. And why is this fundamental domain much better than the unit square? As I told you, the fundamental domain is made of sides 
which are always parallel to the eigen directions, and eigen directions are preserved. So the image of this fundamental domain, let's see it now. How do we do? Well, to simplify, let me divide the fundamental domain into two rectangles, a pink one and a gray one. And the image of them in the plane, which is uh, simpler for us to analyze, so imagine that this is the origin of the plane. It's like that. The pink rectangle, it, its image, it's still a rectangle because its sides are parallel to the eigen directions, and the horizontal side gets bigger because it's an expanding direction, and the vertical side gets smaller because it's a contracting direction. And it actually goes all over to the end of this puzzle here. So as you see, the image of the pink I have drew as red, it crosses the pink from left to right, and it also crosses the gray from left to right. So this is the image of the pink. And similarly, we can find the image of the gray. The image of the gray is this black part here, which crosses two other puzzles or two other fundamental domains that we have constructed. This one here in the upper region of this fundamental domain, and this one in the middle of the fundamental domain, all the way from left to right. Okay? Well, to simplify the understanding, let me subdivide this gray rectangle into two rectangles, one still gray and the other blue, so that the gray part the gray part, its image will hit the second puzzle, and the blue part, its image will hit the third puzzle. So the image of these three rectangles is as follows. Pink comes to red, as it used to be. Gray, now it's smaller, so its image is just this black part here. So it's inside the second puzzle. And blue, it's all of this here, so it crosses entirely the third puzzle. And what is the idea? The idea, as you see, is that since we have constructed a fundamental domain parallel to the angle directions, you have no problem of variation of direction as we had before. Before we had horizontal, and after one iteration, it became diagonal. Now it's in this direction, it becomes always in this direction and the other one as well. And why is this good? Well, now I'm going to introduce to you the idea of symbolic dynamics. And symbolic dynamics is actually a way of uh, giving a simpler representation of the trajectories of the model that we are interested in. So here we have a function f, which is the cat map. And in order to describe the dynamics of this cat map, we should get a point x and to tell what is x, what is f of x, what is f composed with f of x, which we call f2 of x, f3 of x, which is f composed with f composed with f applied in x, and so on. So the whole trajectory of points uh, starting at x. Well, doing this is very complicated, as you saw from a geometrical point of view, and you could imagine that it's even more complicated for a computer. The computer would have to have a huge data associated to this trajectory because to each of the points we should specify what was the x and the y position of the point of its image of its second image and so on and because it's x and y position it's a real number so you have uh, mistakes that you make the the computer actually doesn't collect exactly the number that it re that is representing the trajectories so you could have errors that could accumulate and after let's say 100 iterations the computer would give to you a number which is totally different from the actual position of the point so symbolic dynamics uh, is a way of saying wait it's very bad to represent this trajectory by saying exactly what are the points 
Let us try to represent the trajectories just saying what are the rectangles that these points are visiting. So for instance, imagine that you have a point in the pink, that after one iteration is in the gray, after two iterations in the pink, after three iterations is, is in the blue. So the idea of symbolic dynamics is trying to describe this trajectory just saying what is the sequence of rectangles that the tra trajectory is visiting. And then when you, if you think a little bit about this, now we are trying to represent trajectories by uh, paths on a graph. What is the graph that is induced by uh, this dynamics? Is the graph that whose vertices are the three rectangles that we have drew, the pink, the gray, the gray and the blue? I could actually make this bigger here, enter full screen. I don't know why I didn't do it before. No, it didn't work. So let me continue like this. Uh, so the graph has as vertices the pink, the gray, and the blue, and we have to have edges, transitions between these vertices. A transition between two vertices is as follows. The pink, its image is the red, and the red crosses the pink, it crosses the gray, and it crosses the blue. So this means that there is a point from the pink whose image is in the pink. So I draw an edge from pink to pink because I can pass after one iteration of the map from pink back to pink. There is also an edge from pink to gray because since the image of the pink intersects the gray, this means that I have a point in pink whose image is in gray. So I can pass after one iteration from pink to gray. And there is also one edge from pink to blue because the image of pink also intersects blue. So I can pass after one iteration from pink to blue. So this graph here in the right uh, hand side of this figure, it represents all possible transitions between rectangles that you have. So for instance, from gray, you can go back to gray and to blue because as you see the image of the gray, which is here painted in black, you should imagine this black here as being reassembled to the fundamental domain up here. So it crosses the pink and it crosses the blue. And finally, the image of the blue, it crosses the fundamental domain all the way from left to right. So it inter intersects all the three original rectangles. So from blue, we have three edges as well, a loop, and one edge to pink and one edge, edge to gray, okay? And now uh, the idea is to say, get a trajectory with respect to the cat map and tell me what is the sequence of rectangles that are being visited. This is going to give, to give us a path on this oriented graph. Position zero, we are at pink. Position one, we are at gray. Position two, we are at blue. Position three, we are at blue. Position four, we are at pink and so on. And you can, you have to agree with me that it's much simpler to describe a trajectory as a path on this graph than to telling you exactly what are all the positions of the trajectory of the point. So the idea of symbolic dynamics is exactly this, to simplify the representation of orbits in a way that we can more easily understand many properties from dynamical, geometrical, statistical, probabilistic point of view. More formally, how do we do this? So we have introduced a graph whose vertices are the rectangles and whose edges are transitions from one rectangle R to a rectangle S every time the image of R intersects S. And paths on this graph are what are going to represent the original trajectories, trajectories of our map. I call this sigma, so all the paths on the graph are going to be sigma. And in this space of all paths, you have a very simple dynamical system, which is the following. Get a path, 
for instance, that has position zero at pink, position one at gray, and so on. And you can associate a new path, which is just evolution on time. You run time by one. So now position zero is gray because position one was gray. And now position one is the previous position two. So you get all the positions and you, you evolved on time one unit. So you moved all the positions to the left. And that's why we call this dynamics the left shift. Mathematically, you are just getting a sequence, which is indexed by Z, and you are moving the sequence one unit to the left. Very simple. And although it's very simple, it still allows us to represent all trajectories of our cat map. How? Let us say that you have a path on a graph and you want to associate it to a real trajectory of the cat map. Well, you just have to consider the proper intersection. You want a point whose at zero position is in the rectangle R0, at position one is in the rectangle R1, at position two is in rectangle R2. So it necessarily has to be a point that belongs to this intersection here in the right-hand side. The intersection of F, the end pre-image of Rn. And because uh, we are lucky, actually not, it's not because we are lucky, but because we chose the right example to work with. We have a property which is called the Markov property, and this I'm not going to explain to you. I'm just going to say that it is a geometrical property that relates the possible intersections that the rectangles have with each other, that tells us that this intersection is non-empty. And also, we have the dynamical properties of the eigendirections, one which is expanding, the other which is contracting, which tells us that this intersection cannot be bigger than just one point. So an intersection that is non-empty and not bigger than just one point has to be just one point. And because of this, we have defined a way of passing from a path on the graph to a point in the tutorials. And the good thing of this map, which I just constructed and which I will call a coding map, is that it makes this diagram to become commuting. So if you compose pi with f, this is equal to the composition of the left shift with pi. And for those who have uh, studied a little bit of dynamics, what we have done was we, we started with our cat map and we have created an extension. We have lifted the cat map to a shift on a graph. In a way that this map pi here is well behaved. So that is my conclusion. The original map, and this left shift, which is very simple from a combinatorial point of view, they are equal, coated equal. And what do I mean by coated equal? I mean that for many purposes with respect to dynamical systems, I can do calculations in the symbolic model instead of the geometric model. And the symbolic model is, very, is much simpler than the geometric model for many situations. For instance, for iterations of the map, for counting periodic points, for analyzing invariant measures, for instance. This third one is more related to ergodic theory, but I, I wanted to put here to, to give you a broad image of the, of the method. So let's wrap up what we have discussed about symbolic dynamics. From the dynamical properties of our cat map, and these properties are the existence of expanding and contracting eigendirections, we are, were able to simplify the representation of trajectories. Instead of telling us exactly what the point x, f of x, f2 of x, and so on were, we could just tell what were the rectangles that these points belong to. And in this way, we have a simple simpler representation of our map, which allows us to understand 
many dynamical properties such as these three that I have listed to you. And once we understand them in this symbolic simplified model, we can push them back to the original geometrical model. So the conclusion is that we can actually count the number of periodic points that the cat map has, which I could not do it geometrically because I, I can, I'm not even able to draw uh, the image of the cat map on the two iterations. So I cannot guess how many points of period 10 that map has. But if I look at the dynamics on that oriented graph, then I can because a point of period 10 is just the number of all paths, closed paths of size 10 that pass it to exactly 10 edges. And this is very simple to calculate. Uh, for instance, you can get this graph. You can look at its adjacent matrix. Let's call it A. You can raise A to the power 10. And the trace of this matrix is going to be exactly the number of paths on this graph of size 10 that start and end at the same vertex. So from a combinatorial point of view, everything gets much more simpler if we have symbolic dynamics. Okay, so now I have introduced to you billiards. I have introduced to you symbolic dynamics. And how do they come together? As I told you, my goal was to analyze those dispersing billiards and Bunimovich billiards. And this is related to a question that this great mathematician called Wolf Bowen left to us in the mid 70s. Bowen, just, just to give a, a short uh, history, he was a brilliant student of uh, Steve Smale, and he made significant contributions to dynamical systems and ergodic theory, but uh, sadly he died at an early age of 32. But nevertheless, he left uh, a notebook. I think he was collecting this, uh, this, this notebook for many years in which he listed important problems in dynamics. And problem number 17 of his notebook was exactly symbolic dynamics for billiards, which is exactly what uh, our talk is about, and which is exactly what my results uh, with co-authors are. We were actually able to construct symbolic dynamics for the class of billiards that I mentioned to you, the dispersing ones and the Bunimovich ones. Let me, let me recall you that these are the billiards that are related to hyperbolic dynamics, the third class of dynamics that I mentioned. And they are related to hyperbolic dynamics. Going a little bit further in this direction means that they have what we call some sort of asymptotic hyperbolicity, which for those who have heard about Lyapunov exponents means that Lyapunov exponents are different from zero. So you have some which are positive. They are related to directions which are expanding, just like the one in the cat map. And you have all the ones which are negative, And these are related to contracting directions, also just like the cat map. And all of these billiards here, they have this asymptotic hyperbolicity. And because they have this asymptotic hyperbolicity, the method of symbolic dynamics was able to be applied to them. So the first result that I want to mention is in collaboration with Carlos Mateus. And we have proved that these, all of these classes of billiards that I have shown to you in the picture in the previous slide, they have symbolic dynamics. So this one, this person, this one, this person, and all of these three Bunimovich billiards, they have a way of looking at the phase space, dividing the phase space into uh, rectangles in such a way that I can come up with an oriented graph that represents the original dynamics of the billiard. And actually, this was made in 2017, and we have restricted ourselves only to billiards in the plane. But 
nowadays we cannot make uh, we do not need to make this restriction because we can also consider billiards in higher dimensional Euclidean spaces. So here I mentioned three to you, which are in the three-dimensional space. So this left hand uh, one is just like playing Pac-Man in the space. So here is like a three totals where sides, where faces are identified. This with this, top with bottom, front with rear, and with two obstacles. So these you have two spheres here as obstacles. So again, if you are in the complement of the obstacles and you look at the obstacles, you see them as being concave. So this is a sort of three-dimensional dispersing billiard. And the same thing happens with the second example. So you could imagine here that you have many cylinders, uh, four cylinders which are vertical and two cylinders which are horizontal, which are uh, defining a region in the middle. And the region in the middle is what we call the billiard table. So a point in the middle, when it looks at the walls, it sees the walls as being concave as well. So this is another example of a dispersing billiard. And the third one is somewhat similar to what we call the Bunimovic Stadium. It's a parallelogram in the middle and glued together with two, it, they are not half spheres, they are, they, 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 they are the union of segments like this in the shape of a half circle. One place like this, the other place like this. And it is known by the huge literature in billiards that all of these three, they also have this kind of asymptotic hyperbolicity associated to. They have non-zero Lyapunov exponents. And then in collaboration with uh, Emerson Araujo and Mauricio Poletti, we were able to show that also for this higher dimensional uh, dispersing and Bonimovic billiards, we have symbolic dynamics, meaning we can get the phase space, decompose it into rectangles. They are no longer geometrical rectangles as we are used to. They are, they, they are dynamical rectangles in a way that we can uh, construct an oriented graph that more easily represents all the trajectories of these billiard maps that we have. So the conclusion, we have studied, uh, we have introduced dynamical billiards. What's nice about them is that depending on the shape of the billiard, we can get different dynamical behavior, elliptic, parabolic, and hyperbolic. We have introduced a tool, a method called symbolic dynamics, which is a way of simplifying the understanding of trajectories of a dynamics. And we have put them together in these two theorems, saying that for the billiards coming from the third class, hyperbolic ones, we have symbolic dynamics. So I think I just got to the end of my talk. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much for this very nice lecture on billiards with very nice uh, uh, animations, videos, I have to say. Uh, <laughs> thank you. It's, well, uh, I, I should say that I got them from YouTube. Uh -huh. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't do them from scratch. I was going to say, how do you make them? But, uh... yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I make them by downloading them from YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very common way to do it. Uh, so we have questions from the audience. Let me remind the audience that you can, uh, some of you have already done this. Uh, you can type in your questions and I will be reading them to you right now. Uh, so first question from Marco, um, is there a particular method to study smooth convex uh, polygons? I mean, symbolic dynamics is a method to study Dunimovic billiards. Similarly, is there a method to study other dynamical, dynamical billiards? Uh, yes, uh, for instance, if you are in the smooth convex, the easiest thing to do is to prove in that they have these caustics as well. So this comes from KAN theory. If you are sufficiently smooth, I think that at least C6, there are works uh, actually that are previous to KAN theory due to Lazutkin, 
in which he proved that such caustics exist. And if you have the caustics, then automatically your trajectories, they get trapped in some regions of the space. And this is enough for the description of the dynamics. Saying that things are bounded is enough for us. We try to come up with things more complicated if the system is more complicated, which is not the case in some sense for the smooth convex one. Yes, for the I polygons, agree. just to conclude, for the polygons, then you go to this uh, business, to a different business, which is of translation surfaces. And then there is a huge field of Teichmüller dynamics. The Teichmüller dynamics doesn't try to look at a particular polygon, but it actually looks at the whole moduli space of uh, polygons that you have. And they try to tell you something about most of the polygons. Yes, I see. Thank you. Uh, another question from Tim this time. Could you uh, briefly explain what eigendirections are? Yes. So you have you have a, a matrix A, and you know that this matrix, well, it's a linear transformation. So to each vector V, you can calculate A of V. It's the matrix A multipli multiplied by the vector V. And if this A of V is collinear with V. So if A of V is a multiple of V, we call V an eigenvector. It's a vector which remains in the same direction as itself. So eigendirection is the direction of this eigenvector. So whenever you find a V like this, you define an eigendirection. Yes, very good. So it comes directly from the language of linear algebra. It's directly from linear algebra, exactly. Uh, next question from Marco. Uh, where can we find more information about dynamical systems and perhaps billiards in particular? What, well, what would be a recommended path to learn this for a young mathematician? There is a movie which is uh, made by Etienne Gis. Uh, let me try to find it here. So if you type movie Etienne Gis, let me see chaos. The movie is called Chaos. So it it is an animation which introduces uh, many of these classical as examples in dynamical systems together with the behavior that they have, and you can find it it for free on uh, on Google or on YouTube, and it's a good introduction to dynamics in general. Uh -huh. It also so, has big So a video by Etienne Gis, a French mathematician. So it's yes, but you can you can see the video in many different languages. It's not a video; it's a movie, actually. I mean, it's a ah. movie full of animations and uh, explanations of the behaviors. Can you can you send them a link, for instance? I can certainly do that. Actually, you can do it yourself, I think, if you go to the chat. You, you as um, Where is the a speaker, are allowed yeah. to use the chat. Yeah. They, they are not, but you are. Find it here. So, movie. I'm going to put it here. The link to the movie. Yeah. Aha. Uh -huh. Thank you. So, people can go and watch it after yeah. this question session is over. Uh, <laughs> uh, so a question from uh, Adnan. Uh, the definition of the convexity depends on the, uh, on the norm, if it's Euclidean or not. So are the results true for non-Euclidean Euclidean convexity? That's a good question. Uh, you also have uh, results on this regard. Usually what people consider are Hadamard manifolds. For those who don't know, Hadamard manifolds are manifolds with non-positive sectional curvature. So having positive curvature, things get more complicated. So if it's either zero or negative, then you have. There are some works of uh, Dima Buragu uh, in which he, he, he gives uh, very nice uh, results on billiards on Hadamard manifolds. 
Uh -huh. Oh, I just, uh, thank you, Pablo. I just noticed that you had sent the link only to us organizers, but oh. Pablo, one of our moderators, just sent it to, to everyone. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, I should have changed here. I just saw No, it. no, no, it's, it's my fault, I should have said. But thankfully we have moderators for that. <laughs> uh, so a question from Milani. Uh, can you use, sorry, let me restate this. Uh, is there a similarity between symbolic dynamics and finite state machines? Finite state what? Machines. Machines? I'm guessing automata maybe. Uh, yes, there is a there is a relation. Uh, this these things, uh, these oriented graphs. If the if the set of vertices is finite, they are just Markov chains. So naturally, you are in the in very similar business. The fact that I that I hid from you, which is actually a great deal in the proofs, is that for the billiards that we have. The number of vertices, the number of rectangles that we have to divide the phase space is not finite. It's countable. Mm. So it's uh, usually countable. And the good thing is that uh, with countable alphabets, we are still in a good situation from the combinatorial point of view. So that's the reason that we can obtain dynamical and probabilistic properties of the billiards. If it was uncountable, then I wouldn't know how to, to obtain these properties. But gladly it's countable. Are there examples where this alphabet would not be countable? Would not be countable? Mm -hmm. Not that I can come up with right now. I could come up with some very, let's say, pathological examples, but then it would not be interesting. Yeah. Right. I see. It would be an example constructed just to make this countability fail. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so here's a question from Kuidango. Can you quickly recap on how the colored regions are separated? Okay, so let's uh, should I go back to the slides? Yes, I think it might be useful to have the pictures. Okay. So can you see it? Yeah. Okay. So I just first I just divided it into two uh, pieces just to be rectangles, and it's like this. And I, as soon as I see the image of these rectangles, I see that the pink one is fine because it crosses only one fundamental domain. It's the red. But the gray one, as you see, its image is black and it crosses two fundamental domains. And just to avoid this double crossing to cross uh, the fundamental domain twice, I pull this back. So this induces to us a division of the gray into two sub rectangles. The left hand side, which is still gray, will now only cross one fundamental domain. Its image is the black region here. And the right hand side, which is the blue, its image is this dark blue here. It will also only cross. Uh, one fundamental domain. And with this, I have divided the, where is it? Uh, I have divided the fundamental domain, the original one into three rectangles, pink, gray, and blue. That's it. Okay. Uh, he says, thank you. Welcome. Uh, so, this is this also means that the answer was very clear. Uh, the, I don't see any more questions, so I think we can say that this is the end of this lecture. Thank you very much again, Yuri. You uh, you Thank are you uh, for inviting me again. It was it's well, always a pleasure. I'm always up for giving these talks to try to bring more young people to mathematics and to do science. Great. It's great to have speakers like you come to, to our school and, and become regular speakers. <laughs> <laughs> Next time I want it to be in person. Oh, that it's, might it's be a, a good, <laughs> It's a good time to be in Paris now. <laughs> <laughs> good point. We'll see what happens. Uh, okay. So many thanks again. So to all the viewers who are still here, we resume 
at uh, 3 p.m. Paris time. That's in 34 minutes for a lecture by Antoine Chamberloir. See you soon.